Hello, welcome to lesson six of the practical OSPF series. In this lesson, we're going to pick apart the concepts of the designated router and the backup designated router. We first mentioned the concept of a designated router and a backup designated router back in lesson three when we discussed hello packets. In that lesson, we told you that DRs and BDRs exist to reduce redundant LSA flooding. We told you that a DR and BDR are elected using a priority number. A priority number is something that is assigned to every interface that defaults at 1, but can be anything in the range of 0 to 255, and if there happens to be a tie, the router ID is going to break the tie. So in this topology, if all of our routers are using the default priority number of 1, router 4 would become the DR since it has the highest router ID of 4.4.4.4, and router 3 would become the BDR since it has the next highest router ID. And finally, in this lesson, we highlighted that a DR and BDR are going to be elected on any multi-axis link specifically any link with the potential for multiple access. So in today's world, any routers connected via Ethernet will include a DR and BDR election. In OSPF terms, that's referred to as a broadcast and non-broadcast multi-access network, but we'll be unpacking these two terms later on in this series. All of this we uncovered in lesson three when we discussed hello packets. So if any of that is unfamiliar to you, I'd highly recommend going back to watch that section of the hello packets lesson. In the rest of this lesson, we're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to show you the actual process by which a DR and BDR is elected, and we'll show you exactly what every router does when it's joining an OSPF network. And we're going to do that by turning off all four of the routers in this topology and turning them on one at a time to show you exactly what each of them are doing. We're going to start by turning on router 1. And as soon as we enable OSPF on router 1, router 1 is going to start sending hello packets. Now, we unpacked all the pieces of information inside Hello Packets in a previous lesson. For this lesson, we just want to highlight these four fields. Router 1 is going to include its own router ID of 1.1.1.1. It's going to include its currently configured priority number, which is the default of 1. And then it's going to include these two fields, indicating that Router 1 currently believes the DR and the BDR to be 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. What this means is that router1 doesn't currently know who the DR and the BDR are on this link, which makes sense because we just turned router1 on. What router1 is trying to do is to see if a DR or BDR already exists. Now, of course, you and I know that there is no current DR or BDR on this link, namely because the other three routers on this link are still currently disabled. So router1 is going to send out this hello packet and continue to periodically send out hello packets that look exactly like this, for a particular duration, looking to see if a DR already exists. That duration is known as the wait timer. It's identical to the dead interval timer in duration, which defaults to 40 seconds on Ethernet networks. After the wait timer, it's going to determine that there is no DR on this link, and router1 will assign itself the title of designated router. From that point forward, all of router1's hello packets will look like this. It'll include the same router ID and priority, now it'll include its interface IP address as the DR IP. And notice that at the moment, the BDR IP is still all zeros because there is no BDR on this link. And so that's the process by which a new router joins a multi-axis link. And router one will continue to send out these hello packets indefinitely until another router joins the link. In this case, router two. Once OSPF is enabled on router two, router two is also going to start out by sending out hello packets. And just like with router 1, router 2's initial hello packet is going to include these four fields. It's going to include its own router ID of all 2's, its configured priority number, in this case 1, and notice that in router 2's initial hello packets, the DR IP and BDR IP are going to be all zeros. Just like before with router 1, router 2 is trying to see if a DR already exists. You'll see this is the process that any router uses when it's first enabled with OSPF. In this case, however, there is a DR on this link, and router1 is still sending out those periodic hello packets. And at some point, router2 is going to receive a hello packet from router1. But notice that router1 and router2 both have the same priority number. Well, we already mentioned that if there's a tie, the router IDs are going to break the tie. And the highest router ID is better. And router2 has a higher router ID than router1. However, the designated router election process does not preempt, meaning if there's a DR currently on the link and currently doing its job, a new, potentially better priority number or router ID router is not going to become the new DR. Router 1 will remain the designated router on this link. 
However, there is no backup designated router on this link. Router 2 will elect itself the backup designated router. And after that point, all of Router 2's hello packets will look like this. Router 2 will include Router 1's IP address as the DR IP address, and Router 2 will include its own IP address as the BDR IP address. And now, Router 1 and Router 2 will continue to send hello packets to this link that'll look like this. Both of them agree on the IP addresses for the DR and the BDR, and both of them, of course, will be sending out their own router ID and priority numbers, respectively. At this point, you can probably guess what happens next. Router 3 and Router 4 will be enabled, and both of them will initially send out a hello packet with empty DR and BDR IP addresses, because they, just like Router 1 and Router 2, will first try and discover if a DR and BDR already exist. Then they will receive the hello packets from Router 1 and Router 2, which will tell them that a DR and BDR already exist on this link, and they will then update their hello packets to now include the DR and BDR IP addresses. Router 3 and Router 4 will then become something other than the DR, otherwise known as the druther, or potentially DR other. I've heard it said both ways. So that's the sequence of events that occurs during a DR and BDR election process. Remember first, a router tries to discover if a DR or BDR already exists. If so, it leaves that current DR and BDR in place. And if not, it becomes the DR or BDR as necessary. Next, we're gonna be looking at how the status of DR, BDR, or druther affect the neighbor adjacency process. Back in lesson four, we showed you the full neighbor adjacency process. We talked through every one of these states. On a multi-access link, every router is gonna synchronize their link state database with the DR and the BDR, which means every router on a multi-access link is gonna go through the entire neighbor adjacency sequence with the DR and BDR until they get to the full state. This is required so that every router can synchronize with the DR and the BDR. But what about the druthers? Well, the druthers are not actually gonna synchronize their link state database with each other. Therefore, their neighbor adjacency sequence is actually going to stop at the two-way state. In theory, router three is gonna synchronize with the DR, and router four is also gonna synchronize with the DR, which means router three and router four's link state database should be identical, but they're not going to synchronize directly with each other. Therefore, they don't need to go all the way to the full state. And all of this can be proven with a show IP OSPF neighbor command on each of these routers. For this topology, Router 1's show IP OSPF neighbor is going to look like this. Notice for each of the routers on this link, Router 1 has the full neighbor adjacency state. Router 1 also properly identifies that Router 2 is the BDR, and Router 3 and 4 are both druthers. Router 2's show IP OSPF neighbor also includes the full neighbor adjacency with all the other routers on this link. But notice that Router 3 and Router 4's show IP OSPF neighbor indicate that the neighbor adjacency between router three and router four stopped at the two-way state. And that's intentional and working as intended because with OSPF, druthers do not go to the full state with each other, only with the DRs and the BDRs. Now, I wanna make a quick point of clarity. We've been referring to router one as the DR or router four as the druther, but the status of DR, BDR, or druther is actually a per interface term not a per router term. So it's not that router one is the DR, it's that this particular interface on router one is the designated router. It's very possible that router one might have another link somewhere else, and potentially this link could be a druther or a BDR or something else. All of these terms that we've been discussing are per interface and not per router. Keep that in mind. With that out of the way, I wanna bring your attention to something. Notice that in our topology, router1 was elected as the DR solely because it was enabled first. In fact, if you look at the priority number and the router ID, router1 actually has the worst priority number and router ID. But because it was enabled first and claimed the title of DR when no one else was the DR, it remained the DR on this link. The issue, however, is this wasn't deterministic, meaning if all of these routers were to reboot and the current configuration were left in place, if they all came back up, router four would then become the new designated router, since it has the best router ID since everybody is using the default priority number. If I wanted router one to remain the DR, I'd have to influence the election by modifying the priority number. 
And as we mentioned before, the priority number is 0 to 255 and simply defaults to 1. And ties are, of course, broken by the router ID. There is one special priority number that we didn't mention before, and that's the priority number of 0. I can set a particular interface priority number to 0 to indicate that that interface should never become the DR or BDR. Whichever interface I set to priority 0 will always be a druther no matter what. Now, there are certain types of network designs that require this to be the case. That'll make more sense when you look at the different network designs that exist with OSPF. Either way, this is the command you would use to set an OSPF priority number. And notice you have to do it inside the interface configuration itself, because again, the priority number is a per interface item. So in our topology, if I wanted to set some priority numbers to force router 1 to be the DR and router 2 to be the BDR, and just for an example, to force router 4 to never be the DR or BDR, what I could do is set priority numbers like so. I could give router 1 a priority number of 50, router 2, 25, router 3 can be left the default, that way if one of these fail, router 3 can take over as the BDR, and here I've set router 4 to 0, indicating I never want router 4 to be the DR or BDR, even if all three routers on this link fail. These priority numbers are also reflected in the show IP OSPF neighbor command, and if we look at the output to that command, you'll see that they now reflect the new priority numbers that we have configured on this link. Setting the priority numbers as we did now creates deterministic DR and BDR election. We know for a fact router 1 will become the DR and router 2 will become the BDR if all four of these routers were to come up at the exact same time. But keep in mind that the DR and BDR election do not preempt. If router 3 were to have come up first before router 1 and router 2, then router 3 would become the DR on this link. So a good rule of thumb is to set the priority number for the router you want to be the DR and BDR higher than the default. And for any other router that you explicitly don't want to be the DR or BDR, set that priority number to zero. So that wraps up discussing the election of the DR and the BDR. But there's still a question we haven't answered, and that's what exactly happens when there's a routing update to send on this link. That's what we're going to be looking at next. We're going to run through the sequence of events that occurs when the DR has an update, when the BDR has an update, and of course, when a druther has an update. Sending routing updates on a multi-axis segment involves two multicast addresses. We've already told you about this multicast address, 224.0.0.5. This multicast address will reach any OSPF router. But on multi-axis links, another multicast address exists, 224.0.0.6. This multicast address only reaches the DR and the BDR. Both of these multicast addresses will be used when sending updates on a multi-axis link. And let me show you the sequence, starting with an update being sent from the DR. When the DR has a routing update to send, since it's the designated router, it can simply send the routing update in an LSU, or a link state update packet, to the multicast address 224.0.0.5. This will reach all the other routers on this segment. Upon receiving that update, the BDR is going to send an acknowledgement to 224.0.0.5, meaning all the routers on the link will also receive that acknowledgement. And our druthers will send a acknowledgement to simply the DR and the BDR using that new 224.0.0.6 multicast address, meaning only the DR and the BDRs are going to receive that acknowledgement. Now, the reason the BDR is able to send its acknowledgement to everybody on the link is that it confirms that the BDR is still alive and healthy and doing its job. So it's useful for the druthers to see the update from the DR and see the acknowledgement from the BDR. So that's the sequence of packets that occur when the DR has a routing update. Next, we'll show you what happens when the BDR has a routing update. Remember that the BDR already has a full neighbor adjacency with all the other routers in this link, which means the BDR can also directly send the update to every router on the link using the all OSPF routers multicast address which means everybody on the link receives this update. This will prompt the DR to send an acknowledgement to every router on the link. And of course, our druthers will send an acknowledgement to just the DR and BDR multicast address. Notice these two sequences are essentially identical, except for the DR and the BDR are switched. The last sequence that we're going to discuss is what happens if a druther has an update to send on the network. 
what the druther will do is it'll send an LSU to the DR and BDR multicast address, which means router one and router two will receive that update. Router one will then forward the update to the all OSPF routers multicast address, which means that will go to everybody on that link. The BDR will send an acknowledgement to everybody on the link, and then any other druther will send their acknowledgement to just the DR and the BDR. Notice these last three steps are identical to what happens when a DR has an update to send. So that's the sequence of events that occur whenever a DR, BDR, or Druther has a routing update to send on a multi-axis link. That actually wraps up everything we wanted to discuss in this lesson. But before I let you go, I actually have a bonus for you. Everything we discussed in this lesson is actually something I set up in a GNS3 lab, and I captured the packets being sent by all four routers. And I'm going to give you that packet capture file. In that file, you're going to see routers joining a multi-axis link one at a time. Then you'll see the priority numbers being set manually, and then all four routers joining the multi-axis link at the same time. Then you'll see a routing update sent by router one, the DR, router two, the BDR, and finally router three and four, the druthers on our link. As I've said before, the purpose of this course is to give you a practical understanding of OSPF. So I don't want you to just take my word for it on how all this works. Download the packet capture file and prove to yourself everything you learned in this lesson. Then post in the comments the packet numbers which correlate to the events we just discussed. The link to download the packet capture is in the description. And while you're down there, you might as well hit the like and subscribe button. Otherwise, that's it for this lesson. If you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing it with a friend, peer, colleague, dog, cat, study group. Either way, thank you for watching this video, and we'll see you in the next one.